I could scarcely restrain my indignation while I perused the concluding portions of this diatribe. It was clear to me that the yea nay manner, not to say the gentleness, the positive forbearance with which the daddy long legs spoke of that pig, the editor of the gadfly, it was evident to me, I say, that this gentleness of speech could proceed from nothing else than a partiality for the fly, whom it was clearly the intention of the daddy long legs to elevate into reputation at my expense. Any one, indeed, might perceive with half an eye that, had the real design of the daddy long legs been what it wished to appear, it, the daddy, might have expressed itself in terms more direct, more pungent, and altogether more to the purpose. The words penny a liner, mendicant, scullion, and cutthroat were epithets so intentionally inexpressive and equivocal as to be worse than nothing when applied to the author of the very worst stanzas ever penned by one of the human race. We all know what is meant by damning with faint praise, and on the other hand, who could fail to see through the covert purpose of the daddy that of glorifying with feeble abuse? What the daddy chose to say to the fly, however, was no business of mine. What it said of myself was, after the noble manner in which the owl and the owl, the toad, and the, the owl, the toad, the mole, had expressed themselves in respect to my ability, it was rather too much to be coolly spoken of by a thing like the daddy long legs as merely a gentleman of high genius and a scholar. Gentlemen, indeed. I made up my mind at once either to get a written apology from the daddy long legs or to call it out. Full of this purpose, I looked about me to find a friend whom I could entrust with a message to his daddyship, and as the editor of the lollipop had given me marked tokens of regard, I at length concluded to seek assistance upon the present occasion. I have never yet been able to account in a manner satisfactory to my own understanding for the very peculiar countenance and demeanor with which Mr. Crabbe listened to me as I unfolded to him my design. He again went through the scene of the bell rope and cudgel, and did not omit the duck. At one period, I thought he really intended to quack. His fit, nevertheless, finally subsided as before, and he began to act and speak in a rational way. He declined bearing the cartel, however, and in fact dissuaded me from sending it at all, but was candid enough to admit that the daddy long legs had been disgracefully in the wrong more especially in what related to the epithets gentleman and scholar. Toward the end of this interview with Mr. Crabbe, who really appeared to take a paternal interest in my welfare, he suggested to me that I might turn an honest penny and at the same time advance my reputation by occasionally playing Thomas Hawk for the lollipop. I begged Mr. Crabbe to inform me who was Mr. Thomas Hawk and how it was expected that I should play him. Here Mr. Crabbe again made great eyes, as we say in Germany, but at length, recovering himself from a profound attack of astonishment, he assured me that he employed the words Thomas Hawk to avoid the colloqu colloquialism Tommy, which was low, but that the true idea was Tommy Hawk, or Tomahawk, and that by playing Tomahawk he referred to scalping, browbeating, and otherwise using up the herd of poor devil authors. I assured my patron that if this was all, I was perfectly resigned to the task of playing Thomas Hawk. Hereupon, Mr. Crabb desired me to use up the editor of the Gadfly forthwith in the fiercest style within the scope of my ability, and as a specimen of my powers, this I did, upon the spot in a review of the original Oil of Bob occupying 36 pages of the lollipop. I found playing Thomas Hawk, indeed, a far less onerous occupation than poetizing for I went upon system altogether, and thus it was easy to do the thing thoroughly well. My practice was this. I bought auction copies, cheap, of Lord Brougham's speeches, Cobbett's complete works, the new slang syllabus, the whole art of snubbing, Prentice's Billingsgate, folio edition, and Lewis G. Clark on tongue. These works I cut up thoroughly with a curry comb, and then, throwing the shreds into a sieve, sifted out carefully all that might be thought decent, a mere trifle, reserving the hard phrases which I threw into a large tin pepper caster with longitudinal holes, so that an entire sentence could get through without material injury. 
The mixture was then ready for use. When called upon to play Thomas Hawk, I anointed a sheet of fool scrap with the white of a gander's egg, then shredding the thing to be reviewed as I had previously shredded the books, only with more care so as to get every word separate, I threw the latter shreds in with the former, screwed on the lid of the caster, gave it a shake, and so dusted out the mixture of the egged fool scrap. Where it stuck, the effect was beautiful to behold. It was, it was captivating. Indeed, the reviews I brought to pass by this simple expedient have never been approached, and were the wonder of the world. At first, though, bashfulness, at first through bashfulness, the result of an experience, I was a little put out by a certain inconsistency, a certain air of the bazaar, as we say in France, worn by the composition as a whole. All the phrases did not fit, as we say in the Anglo-Saxon. Many were quite awry, some even were upside down, and there were none of them which were not in some measure injured in regard to effect by the latter species of accident when it occurred, with the exception of Mr. Lewis Clark's paragraphs, which were so vigorous and altogether stout that they seemed not particularly disconcerted by any extreme of position, but looked equally happy and satisfactory, whether in the hands or on the heels. What became of the editor of the Gadfly after the publication of my criticism of his Oil of Bob, it is somewhat difficult to determine. The most reasonable conclusion is that he wept himself to death. At all events, he disappeared instantaneously from the face of the earth, and no man has seen even the ghost of him since. This matter having been properly accomplished, and the furies appeased, I grew at once into high favor with Mr. Crabb. He took me into his confidence, gave me a permanent situation as Thomas Hawk of the Lollipop, and, as for the present, he could afford me no salary, allowed me to profit at discretion by his advice. My dear Thingham, said he to me one day after dinner, I respect your abilities and love you as a son. You shall be my heir. When I die, I will bequeath you the lollipop. In the meantime, I will make a man of you. I will, provided always that you follow my counsel. The first thing to do is to get rid of the old boar. Boar, I, said I inquiringly. Pig, eh? Aper, as we say in Latin. Who? Where? Your father said he. Precisely, I replied. Pig, you have your fortune to make, Thingham, resumed Mr. Crabb, and that governor of yours is a millstone about your neck. We must cut him at once. Here I took out my knife. We must cut him, continued Mr. Crabb, decidedly and forever. He won't do, he won't. Upon second thoughts, you had better kick him, or cane him, or something of that kind. What do you say, I suggested modestly, to my kicking him in the first instance? caning him afterward, and winding up by tweaking his nose. Mr. Crabb looked at me musingly for some moments, and then answered, I think, Mr. Bob, that what you propose would answer sufficiently well, indeed remarkably well, that is to say, as far as it went, but barbers are exceedingly hard to cut, and I think, upon the whole, that having performed upon Thomas Bob the operations you suggest, it would be advisable to blacken with your fists both his eyes very carefully and thoroughly to prevent his ever seeing you again in fashionable promenades. After doing this, I really do not perceive that you can do any more. However, it might be just as well to roll him once or twice in the gutter, and then put him in charge of the police. Any time the next morning you can call at the watch house and swear an assault. I was much affected by the kindness of feeling toward me personally, which was evidenced which was evinced in this excellent advice of Mr. Crabbe, and I did not fail to profit by it, forthwith. The result was that I got rid of the old boar, and began to feel a little independent and gentlemanlike. The want of money, however, was, for a few weeks, a source of some discomfort, but at length, by carefully putting to use my two eyes and observing how matters went just in front of my nose, I perceived how the thing was to be brought about. I say thing, be it observed, for they tell me the Latin for it is rem. By the way, talking of Latin, can anyone tell me the meaning of quocunque, or what is the meaning of modo? My plan was exceedingly simple. I bought for a song a sixteenth of the snapping turtle. 
That was all. The thing was done. But, and, and I put money in my purse. There were some trivial arrangements afterwards, to be sure, but these formed no portion of the plan. They were a consequence, a result. For example, I bought a pen, ink, and paper, and put them to, into furious activity. Having thus completed a magazine article, I gave it for appellation, Epoel LOL, by the author of The Oil of Bob, and enveloped it to the Gusterum Fudel. That journal, however, having pronounced it twaddle, in the monthly notices to correspondence, I reheaded the paper Hey Diddle Diddle by Thingum Bob Esquire, author of The Ode on the Oil of Bob, and editor of The Snapping Turtle. With this amendment, I re-enclosed it to the Gusterum Fudel, and while I awaited a reply published daily in the Turtle, six columns of what may be termed philosophical and analytical investigation of the literary merits of the Gusterum Fudel, as well as the personal character of the editor of the Gusterum Fudel. At the end of a week, the Gusterum Fudel discovered that it had, by some odd mistake, confounded a stupid article headed Hey Diddle Diddle, and composed by some unknown ignoramus, with a gem of resplendent luster similarly entitled The Work of Thingum Bob Esquire, the celebrated author of The Oil of Bob, the Gusterum Voodle deeply regretted it, this very natural accident, and promised, moreover, an insertion of the genuine Hey Diddle Diddle in the very next number of the magazine. The fact is, I thought, I really thought, I thought at the time, I thought then, and have no reason for thinking otherwise now, that the Gusterum Voodle did make a mistake, with the best intentions in the word, in the world. I never knew anything that made as many singular mistakes as the Gusterum Fudel. From that day, I took a liking to the Gusterum Fudel, and the result was I soon saw into the very depths of its literary merits, and did not fail to expatiate upon them in the turtle whenever a fitting opportunity occurred. And it is to be regarded as a very peculiar coincidence, as one of those positively remarkable coincidences which, it, which set a man to serious thinking, that just such a total revolution of opinion, just such an just such entire bouleversement, as we say in French, just such thorough topsy turviness, uh, if we may be per if I may be permitted to employ a rather forcible term, has happened pro and con between myself on the one part and the Gusterum Fudel on the other. It did actually again happen in a brief period afterwards, and with precisely similar circumstances in the case of myself and the Rowdy Dow, and in the case of myself and the Humdrum. Thus it was that by a master stroke of genius, I at length cons consummated my triumphs by putting money in my purse, and thus may be said really and fairly to have commenced that brilliant and eventful career which rendered me illustrious, and which now enables me to say with Chateaubriand, I have made history. J'ai fait l'histoire. I have indeed made history. From the bright epoch which I now record, my actions, my works, are the property of mankind. They are familiar to the world. It is then needless for me to detail how soaringly, how soaring rapidly I fell heir to the lollipop, how I merged this journal in the humdrum, how again I made purchase of the Rowdy Dow, thus combining the three periodicals, how lastly I effected a bargain for the sole remaining rival and united all the literature of the country in one magnificent magazine known everywhere as the Rowdy Dow Lollipop Humdrum and Gusterum Fudel. Yes, I have made history. My fame is universal. It extends to the uttermost ends of the earth. You cannot take up a common newspaper in which you shall not see some allusion to the immortal Thingum Bob. It is Mr. Thingumbob said so, and Mr. Thingumbob wrote this, and Mr. Thingumbob did that. But I am meek and expire with a with an humble heart. After all, what is it, this indescribable something which men will persist in terming genius? I agree with Buffon, with Hogarth. It is but diligence after all. Look at me, how I labored, how I toiled, how I wrote. Ye gods, did I not write? I knew not the word ease. By day I adhered to my desk, 
and at night, a pale student, I consumed the midnight oil. You should have seen me. You should. I leaned to the right. I leaned to the left. I sat forward. I sat backward. I sat, sat, tete besse, bowing my head close to the alabaster page, and through all I wrote. Through joy and sorrow, I wrote. Through hunger and through thirst, I wrote. Through good report and through ill report, I wrote. Through sunshine and through moonshine, I wrote. What I wrote is unnecessary to say. The style. That was the thing. I caught it from Fat Quack. Whiz, fizz. And I am giving you a specimen of it now. 